His enthusiasm sparked an energy in us that was so infectious that we had to get down there and record it and get it done right away. They happened to meet two young ladies that night in the club and brought them back to the motel with us. And they both happened to be white. This is the only way that we know you, but in that 54 period history, you've had some challenges. When he gets out of his car and starts talking to a black man, instead of him wanting to respect that black man, the first thing he wants to do is intimidate that black man. So he tells him, get on the ground, spread eagle. Every black man in America know what that is. Uh, yes, I'm with the Whispers. I'm Deborah, and I'm so excited to finally be back with you guys again. Yes, yes. Glad we did. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm just glad to see your faces. You know, this uh, lockdown has really been something, especially for those of us in the entertainment industry. You know, my life has been about being able to share stories with you guys and people like you to, you know, millions of people. And this has kind of put a somewhat of a slowdown on that. Oh, I mean, more, more than that. I mean, it's put a complete dent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's still putting it mildly. Yes, yes, yes. So today, we're going to talk about your new release. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know How we're excited long? about talking about that. We're always excited about talking about new music after all these years. Yeah, Definitely. you know, and I'll tell you what I find interesting. Uh, the song that you guys uh, just released, How Long? And, and feel free to jump on, in on any of this, but if I'm not mistaken, years ago when... Uh, R&B music was really taking the chart in terms of classic, uh, you know, soul, like what you guys do. There was a lot of dissension in some camps as some groups started to uh, record social uh, music about social injustice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, where a, a lot of times the labels and executives and, and producers just wanted them to keep singing the love songs. But, you know, these were black people who were going through a lot of the same struggles that uh, people who hadn't made it to the top or who weren't entertainment, but because their skin was black, they were still encountering those same struggles. And there was a lot of uh, controversy and challenges just in being able to produce that kind of music. Well, you know what, what Deborah, what I remember about that most is that is a, the, the thing that I hate the most about record labels uh, you know, for a long time, we wanted to do a gospel album. And of course, you know this. I feel funny because the audience, know, you know all about the whispers. I mean, we talk intimately about all kinds of subjects. But that's okay. It's still always fresh and new. <laughs> exactly. But I remember us desperately wanting to do a gospel album. And the record label told us, guys, you know, we want to do a gospel album. But right now, we got to do what's making money. You got hits. And the beat goes on, it's, it's, it's rocking. So we're going to have to put the gospel out until later. Well, fortunately for us, even before that, the Whispers were making image music, music that dealt with the times. And long ago, we came with a song called, if you remember, Seems Like I Gotta Do oh, Wrong, yeah. before they noticed me. They noticed me. And thank God we did before we had And the Beat Goes On, because as you say, I don't even know if the record company would have even wanted us to jump into something that controversial. But from the very beginning, uh, you know, Nick Caldwell, God bless his soul, you know, we talked about what we wanted to be like and what we wanted to sing about. And when that song came along and we first heard it, we jumped on it because if you remember, 1965 is when we had the Watts riots. Mm -hmm. Yeah was inducted into the U.S. Army in April of 1965, and I watched the Watch Riots from Vietnam. Another day has come and gone In a world where I don't belong Another week has 
pass me by It's not because I didn't try Nobody saw me walking And nobody heard me talking Talk to me like I gotta do wrong, gotta do wrong, gotta do wrong But I remember asking myself, you know, if you remember we saw black people carrying furniture out of furniture stores <laughs> televisions but that was 40 years ago and here we go fast forward yeah. 40 years later and we doing here's a, it's the same thing happening with black people being mistreated same you know what the only difference is now the whole world because of this lockdown couldn't close their eyes to what was going on it was caught on video and you couldn't ignore it and <laughs> and it's a shame that we owe that kind of debt of gratitude to George Floyd. You know, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I, I want to mention something too. As you mentioned, uh, seems like I got to do right, or it seems like I got to do wrong. And we've had discussions before about that being, you know, your social uh, injustice song. But I kind of think you also have another one, and that is Olivia. <laughs> when you really think about it, uh, lost and turned out. Yes. Uh, I wrote some of the lyrics down just to kind of remind myself. Uh, she's spending most of her time walking the streets. She's got a certain quota to fill. Yeah. She wants to buy, and then yeah. a new Seville. She. You know what? In today's society, we would refer to that as human trafficking. That's exactly right. But yeah. but it's it's still it's still even though it's an older song, it's still the the message still resonates. It's still real and and needed today. And so when you guys decided to do uh, how long, I was just blown away because you know of course I'm in love with all the love music. But yeah. uh, this was, you know, all of us are feeling something. And so I guess this was one of those moments where you, you couldn't hold back. Yeah, uh, I remember Scotty, well, you can tell him the story. Scotty was the first one that, one that heard this song and it was sent to him by Magic, who you know very well, mm -hmm. who's our bass player. Yeah. So, okay, you gotta tell him the story. Well, uh, what I did, once I heard the song, the first thing I did was get on the horn to Lavelle, my brother, and my thing, I said, first of all, I want you to hear the song because I know once you hear it with your A&R ability, I'm not gonna have to say much else. And that's kind of what happened. I and so for those who don't know, A&R is artist and repertoire, right? <laughs> you remember, we're, we're talking to the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let me put it like this. We're old enough to know hits when we hear them. We've been here long enough. And so when I called Lavelle, <laughs> yeah, I remember he said to me, man, you sound like when he was 20 years ago when you tried to sell me other things. I never heard you just excited about it. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What other things could you have possibly been selling? <laughs> I normally never do this, number one, but the reason why I was so adamant with Lavelle is because him being in Las Vegas, I knew we had to get him down here. And I was trying to let him know, man. Down here meaning Los Angeles. Down here, yeah. we're in Los Angeles, the bell is in Las Vegas. And we were, we were needing to get him to Los Angeles. And I was explaining to him, this is one time we gotta have, uh, I call it the Ferrari top. Meaning, <laughs> let me explain that. We need the top that he sings for the whispers had to be on this record. You know, sometimes I would do it because for convenience, but on this one, I said, no, no, you got to be here, brother. And he <laughs> said, I will, I will come, but I'm not getting on no plane. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
you know, when, when the pandemic first started, it really started in March, but we were in the middle of the pandemic. And Lavelle said, I'm not getting on no plane, I'll drive. <laughs> and so we record this song in Scotty's garage. We did convince him to fly, he and Harmony, from Atlanta. They had to fly, they couldn't drive. <laughs> First of all, let's go back a little bit further. This song was written, Deborah, in 1983. Magic wrote this song in 1983, again, with a message oriented, uh, you know, uh, talking about how long is it gonna take for us to realize that if we just love each other a little bit more, that's what this song basically was about. But we had to get it done. And of course, in April, if you remember, everybody was wearing masks. Mm -hmm. So we got Lavelle, Lavelle drove down here in his mask and he came to Scotty's house. We were all sitting up in the house with mask on. We got Magic here from Atlanta. He, got, he had his mask, came in harmony. And the actual song for the parts and the lead in the background was done in the garage. So that meant- But not in masks, were they? You go out, you go out to the garage in your mask. Uh-huh. You say, put the mic up, take your mask off, <laughs> Put that mask back on. Oh my goodness. And the same thing I did, the same thing Scotty did. But because of the urgency, we wanted to take advantage. You, you know what? We were all set, as you say, Deborah, to come with a typical whisper song. We had a love song written by Grady, who you know very, very well, that we were coming with as a single. But like you said, the good Lord made it that on that day, the whole world was watching George Floyd with that knee on his neck. The whole world got to see, we couldn't run away from it. And we said right then and there, we're gonna put the Whisper Love song on hold. We've got to record this song, talking about how long is it gonna take? What will it take for people to understand that black folks are just like everybody else? Mm -hmm. So we took the opportunity to put this song out. We, we did it in April, you know, and by May, we, you know, we, the finishing touches and it's brand new now. And it's talking about how long, how long is it going to take for us to continue to be mistreated as black people? You know, I have to just pause there for a second. When I started getting some of the story about this new release, the thing that shocked me the most because I know, I know you guys, I've never seen you move that fast on anything. It's very true. And you know, and I don't mean it like you're slow. I just mean you guys ponder, you consider, you meet, you make sure all the I's are dotted and every T is crossed. You make sure everybody is happy. You're, I mean, you're super sensitive to your environment and you ponder and you listen and you re-listen. And this was, this must have been a God thing. Must have been a God thing. More than that. Oh, it been definitely. More than that to me, uh, Devorah, is that uh, when, when Scotty sent the, the song to me, and after I listened to it, I said, oh yeah, that's a, that's a smash. That, that, could, that is right on point. But like Scotty said, I, <laughs> his excitement, I haven't seen his excitement like that since 1932. So <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's going on, but he was the most excited I've seen him ever about a song. So just from that standpoint, you know, being who we are as a group, I said, if he's feeling this strong about the song, I don't care what it sounds like. I'm coming just on GP because he really wants to record this and get this out because We've done things like, you know, when we had the Vietnam War came out, we did a song for the war and then the war ended before we could get it out. So <laughs> I didn't want that to happen. I wanted the message to be in the middle of, you know, what was going on. So yeah, he's right. His enthusiasm sparked an energy in us that was so infectious that we had to get down there and record it and get it done right away. You know, after I heard it, uh, I totally get why you were so enthused about doing it. And not just enthused, but I understand you were pretty adamant about just getting this done and getting it done now. And, and you're right, the time is right for it and we can't wait. So to, the, to that point, I wanna talk a little bit about your history 
uh, especially for people who just don't know. You know, you guys are the whispers. You've had chart topping records for over 50 years. What is it, 56 years now? 54. 54, okay, I, I gave you two. But yeah. 54 <laughs> years, you've had chart topping songs that are just loved and celebrated literally all over the world. You know, a lot of times we say around the world, but no, literally every continent on the planet celebrates the Whispers music. And, you know, so this is the only way that we know you, but in that 54 period history, you had some challenges. And if I can even maybe cite one that I know about, just to kind of make it real to people that the things that you all went through back then, you know, you can totally relate to what's going on now. You had a, I don't remember what state you were in, but I'm sure it was a, was a Southern state, I believe. And you ended up, was it in Johnny Cash's studio? Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, yeah. so you wanna share that story? You had a, I don't remember what state you were in, but I'm sure it was a, was a Southern state, I believe. And you ended up, was it in Johnny Cash's studio? Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, yeah. so you want to share that story? Oh, man, what a story. Yeah. Well, when we got into town, well, let me go back. When we, when we got into town, there had been a young black boy killed before we even got there. So there was a high intensity going on. There was, real, there was nervousness everywhere. And when we checked into the motel back then, the motel that we checked into we saw guys on the roof, like they were guarding the place. With rifles. With rifles. And I, re I, I remember I said, <laughs> I said to Nick, let's turn around and go to another, either hotel or more, but we don't need to be here. And Nick said to me, Scotty, you, you know, I hear that, but it ain't, it ain't all that bad. I said, Nick, I'm telling you, this is not the spot to be in. We ignored that. We went on in and checked in, went to the club, did our show, and there was two guys back then, one worked for us and one was one of the whispers. Marcus was the whisper, and one of the guys that worked for us, Andre. Andre, they happened to meet two young ladies that night in the club and brought them back to the motel with us. And they both happened to be white. Oh, goodness. <laughs> now, keep in mind, you know, we're talking about Nashville. You know, we shouldn't have been there in the first place as far as I'm concerned, but hey, it, it was what it was or it is what it is today. But anyway, they brought the young ladies back and then we all went to one room to sort of take care of business with other stuff. And we were all in the room and, and we hear this, boom, 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 like somebody's like somebody gonna knock the door down. So we opened the door and when we opened the door, there were rifles all around the door shotguns, rifles, Every, I mean, we, we, we thought life, at least I did, I thought life was over that night. And the guy said to us, the two young ladies that you brought back with them, if they're not out of here in a certain amount of time, everybody's dead. Oh and at that time, our manager, Dick Griffey, who was, that was home for him, Nashville was his home. He went out of control. He went to telling the police, I guess they were police, but it was so many of them. I don't know if they were police, Klan or whatever, but he went crazy. And I never will forget Nick Caldwell and Carl Dickens just pushed him to the ground. They couldn't stop. They, you know, he was saying, get the F out of here. What y'all doing? This is all again. Everything he shouldn't have been saying. So they wrestled him down to the ground. And got him to be quiet. And the guy, the, what really got him to be quiet, one of the guys said, if he say another word, we're gonna kill everybody in here. Of course, at that time, it was time to go to the men's room and the women's room, wherever you, wherever you, wherever you go, take care. You know, let's tell the truth. Some of us went to the men's room right there. <laughs> And he said, if you say another word, we're going to kill everybody in here. So we finally got him quiet, and they left. And one of the guys who was like a roadie had called a friend of his who knew Johnny Cash, 
because we knew we had to leave there that night, and we did. He ended up taking us to the studio, which was owned by Johnny Cash, and we spent the rest of the night there. And of course, the next day we got out of there like like we was running the race. Wow. See, so I, I knew some of the story, but I didn't know the details. You know, and see, here's the thing. Yeah, you can look at it and say, okay, we shouldn't have been here. This shouldn't have, this person shouldn't have done this or that. But what it, what it all boils down to is, black or white or whatever, you're all people and people do people things. And yeah. it's just a shame that when somebody that looks like us does, uh, in your case, what guys, and particularly a lot of times musicians, you know, they meet people on the road. And even though maybe that wasn't the best circumstance, but it should not have threatened your life. Yeah. Right. Well, That's yeah, it, it shouldn't have, but it did. There's, just, there's no, no question about it. And the only thing that's relevant to bring that up to what's going on, that lets you know what's going on today with George Floyd was the same thing that was going on 40 years ago. I mean, this is the first time we've seen this, these kind of situations. We've been here long enough to see we have been mistreated as black people. There is police brutality. Lavelle can tell you about that personally. You know, there, there's no question about it. So that, again, we're back to the important, that's why it was so important to get this song out now because it needs, and this song takes you into a lot of other things that I'm hopeful, hopeful we'll get into in this conversation, like voting and what we as black people need to do to stick together and, but this is not the first time for us. So when we say how long, we mean it. And we want to try to do something to change it. You know, and like I said, Lavelle can give you some, some situations that he went through as a black man that shows you this has been around a long, long time. Yeah, right there in good old Los Angeles. That wasn't it. Oh, deal. LA. <laughs> I'm listening, Lavelle. Well, I mean, you know, you know, back in the day, you know, well, you know, we're, you know, like any, any guy, you know, when you become successful, you'd be able to experience some of your dreams. And some of my dreams, as, as you probably already know, because you know me, I'm a car guy. So I'm always going to have some sort of car because that's who I am. And I, at that time, when we became successful, I said, oh, man, I'm going to get me a Porsche. I got to have me a Porsche. So... I went out and bought me a Porsche, but I didn't realize how much hell that Porsche, driving that Porsche in LA was going to cause me. I went out and bought me a Porsche, but I didn't realize how much hell that Porsche, driving that Porsche in LA was going to cause me. I told people, I tell people today, I got stopped 14 times in one month in that Porsche. Dressed up, a couple of ladies in the car, and driving down the street, most of the time there was a lady in the car or two, and driving down the street, get pulled over, end up on the sidewalk, sitting on the curve, you know, in my dress clothes, nice clothes, because we're getting ready to go party. And always the excuse was used that this car was used, a car like this was used in a robbery. How convenient. Yeah, so I'm like, who the hell uses a Porsche 911 <laughs> to rob someplace. And where are you gonna put the stuff? <laughs> There's no vaccine in the car. There's really no trunk. So, you know, so I had to go to the NAACP where my mother did and she contacted them and they contacted the police precinct that I lived in, district I lived in and let them know if there's one more stop for Lavelle Degree, who's one of the most successful singing groups, the Whispers, we are going to sue you because, you, and you know, you, you have a written documentation because they have to do a police report that he is driving this car. You know what car it is. If you stop him one more time, you're gonna have a lawsuit that's gonna just blow you away because this is totally ridiculous. And it ceased immediately after that. But that's the list that you have to go to. My brother, the same way, seen him 14 times in a month. I saw my brother, he had a Porsche too. Different from him, he didn't have the, the, you know, the success or be a member of a, such a successful group and a well-known group. So I've seen him get choked out when the chokehold was legal 
and choke him to the point where he was unconscious. So uh, that is what is going on. It's been going on forever. And then finally they, you know, just recently, and this was back in 1980, they were choking people out all the way up to now. And like Walter said, this is something that's been ongoing, but because of what you just said earlier, that because people had to stay home, they couldn't go anyplace else. They were really marooned at home. They got to see it firsthand. They got to see a man's life snuffed out on TV, which, and begging for his mother to come and help him. That right there, I don't care what kind of person you are. As a man, I'm 72 years old. That I damn near wanted to cry right there on the spot. And why am watching this man's life drift right out of his body was just devastating for a lot of people. And that's why you see what's going on. Black, white, you know, Latino, Indians, Japanese, everybody's on the street today. As you know, DeVore, back in the 60s, when we had the watch ride, there was not a white person on that street. And if they were on that street, they would have got killed. But this time, it's all, all groups of people are coming Everybody out. Everybody who has an ounce of humanity, really. Exactly, exactly. And they're fighting together. So like I was telling the twins the other day, because we talk about this when we do get together, that to me, this is the first time that I see hope for the, you know, in, ever in my life, because I never, yeah, I've never seen people come together like this. So I think it's going to, you know, look, nobody wants them, nobody wants anybody to die. But I hope that George Floyd's sacrifice will make a big change in this world. And we have to do like you said, the one change we got to make, we got to get our, blood, our black behinds, our yellow behinds, any kind of behind you got. You need to vote. <laughs> that thing that everybody has one of. <laughs> yeah, you need to get out there and vote because we have to get this idiot out of office. Yeah. And not only that, you know, I think, and this is just my opinion, you guys let me know what you think. I think this fellow occupying 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and that party that has agreed to lock, well, it's like they drank some Kool-Aid. They did. I, and for that reason, you know, prior to, I always felt like, you know, you vote for who you think is, will be the best, but they have demonstrated humanity is out the window. It's gone. It's, it's, it's gone. And so they need to go. We need, and like you said, we need to vote and we need to vote Democrat. And it's not because we are so in love with the party, because you know, we all know that no matter who gets in office, we gotta hold their feet to the fire. Right. And, right. and, and Biden better know he owes, what is his name, Clyburn, a huge debt of gratitude. And, yeah. But yeah. we've gotta be diligent and make sure that these laws get changed and like you said, we've got to do that by voting and staying engaged in the process, which is why another thing, I think why the song, How Long is so important, like not just after November 3rd, but we need to replay it and replay it because if we don't, we'll go to sleep. We'll say, okay, we voted, we got our people in office and then we go to sleep and it'll be business as usual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deborah, it's funny that you say that because like I said earlier, you know everybody in our organization. So I'm, let's refer to Mike now, our manager, who you know very well, white Jewish guy. He has two kids that happen to be policemen. And when Scotty played this song for me, the first thing we always do is listen to the lyrics. Mm -hmm. I know that. The first verse simply said, how long are we going to argue? How long are we going to fight? How long is it going to take us to change the wrong to right? From that point on, I told Scotty, you can shut it down. I don't have to hear no more because that lyric has said exactly what I wanted to say. And the reason I refer to Mike is that when LaBelle talked about everybody being at home looking, Mike said the same thing. Now, he, you know Mike well. I don't view him as no racist. Mm -hmm. But what I tried to explain to Mike as I did a lot of my white friends, you are complicit in racism without even knowing it. Right. He didn't want to hear that because he couldn't like privilege. Tell me, you know, I'm not. I said, Mike, let me explain something to you. 
what, what Lavelle just explained, just because we don't talk about it. Mike lived in the Jewish section of Los Angeles. He wasn't in South Central when Lavelle was being stopped. So he, he had no idea of what takes place when a policeman stops a black man. Because we don't talk about it. Mike did not, when, when you stop by the police, Lavelle told you he was stopped because he was driving a Porsche. Me and Scotty, I've been stopped. And they made the excuse, we thought your back light was out, now it's working. <laughs> that's, little, that's the other one, yeah. The thing to Mike is that that transition that takes place between a white policeman that comes from an area where he knows nothing about black people, when he gets out of his car and starts talking to a black man, instead of him wanting to respect that black man, the first thing he wants to do is intimidate that black man. So he tells him, get on the ground, spread eagle. Every black man in America know what that is. Mm -hmm. No matter how much money you got, how much, whatever degree you might have, when you stop by the police, all of that goes out the window. No matter how much money you got, how much, whatever degree you might have, when you stop by the police, all of that goes out the window. Sure. So I tried to explain this to Mike and he said, you know what, well, I never understood that. And the reason is that when he was watching George Floyd, he kept asking the question, why don't you take his knee off his neck? I said, Mike, what I've been trying to tell you, they got it on film now, but that's been happening for 50 years. You know that, Deborah, your husband, me, all of us, we've all gone through that. So this song, when it said, how long are we going to continue to do this? And the part that I like about this song more than ever is that the answer to this is what we've always sung about, is love. to a lot of people, Scotty says this, but if you treat people the way you want to be treated, we can get along. That's showing respect and love for the person. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I think Joe Biden understands this. I'm hoping that he does. But man, this song says it all. That's why we had to get it out and let it be heard. And as you say, I wanted to play over and over again, because if we can just understand it, if we try to love each other, we won't have no problems. It ain't about black and white. You're so it's right. Yeah, that's true. Hey, Joe, if you're listening, play this song. It'll mean a lot to your campaign, too, because it's yeah. right on point for your, exactly. for your campaign. It's one of those songs that could be your, your, you know, your theme song, because it basically talks about what he wants to do. And I have a lot of hope in Joe because of the, the hardships he's gone through. When I heard the other day that he actually gives his personal phone number out for people to call, he's called people when they've had tragedy. I think he understands basically, uh, he's got humanity in him, you yeah. know, he's, and he's humble as all get out. So to me, I think that uh, we're on the, we're headed in the right direction, but I'm always still afraid that at the last minute, our people, because I hear it all the time with people, well, you know, I don't like either one of them, so I'm not going to vote. I'm like, don't even talk to me. I, I think I think they're changing their tune a little bit now because they recognize what happened when they made that choice in the last election. You yeah. cannot, you just can't. And then, you know, too many people who look like us have died for us to have that opportunity and privilege and right to vote. I want to ask you guys about something else in regard to what you just explained about uh, the police intimidation and brutality. Can you, and this might be a little touchy, 
can you describe what personally it felt like for you as a, a man, a black man, a law abiding black man to be put on the ground and told to spread evil? Can you describe what personally it felt like for you as a, a man, a black man, a law abiding black man to be put on the ground and told to spread evil? What, what does that do to you when those moments took place? What does that do to you inside? Well, for me, I, I'd say it made me feel, when I was humiliated, one, I felt less than, I actually felt I was trash because I'm laying on the ground besides trash. You know, I'm right there in the gutter, laying in the gutter, and there's trash all around me. So that's as much as you thought about me, is that, let's put him on the ground, he ain't nothing but trash. You know, so for me, it was just the most, and to be helpless, when you take and make me feel like I'm a child and I have no recourse whatsoever, because at the time that I was put on the ground, there was no cameras, there was no cell phone, there was no way to show that I was treated unjustly. So I had to submit and it almost felt like I was a slave. You know, I was going back to the slavery day. Now I know how slavery felt because I, I mean, I can't fully know how slavery felt, but it gave me a glimpse into what they may have felt. Because you were totally powerless. Totally powerless and, and constantly worrying if I'm going to get shot or I'm going to wind up getting kicked in the head or I'm going to wind up getting punched because nobody's there to witness to see this and, 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 and there to help me if that happens. Because at that point in life, policemen were always right because the, the judge would look at it like, well, what did you do? Well, I didn't do anything. Well, why would he do that? You know, why would our sworn officer punch you in the head or stomp you in the head or, or throw you on the ground? You must have done something wrong. Well, no, we didn't. But now with these cameras, with these cell phones, now people are getting to see it real time. And I'm just so happy about that because I pull in, when I get pulled over now, and it could be for a traffic stop, if, if Tracy's in the car, I'm like, pull your camera out and start filming this, you know? And of course they don't like it, but they can't say anything about it because I want it documented. You kill me, it's gonna be documented. And so for a black man to leave his house, when I leave my house at night, to be worried about the fact that I don't know if I'm coming back because of a police stop. When I see red lights and sirens, or see red lights on my, uh, on my car pulling me over for a simple traffic stop, immediate fear goes into me. But the only thing that gives me comfort is I'm gonna pull out that camera and I'm gonna film every bit of our, you know, our, our encounter. So I'm just feel blessed that, that now we have cell phones to prove what we've been saying for years. Well, here, here, let me add on to, let, just to let most black men in particular know that you're not quite out the woods yet because the video of Rodney King tells me that even cameras don't, you know, that was, that was the best evidence I ever seen of a man being, his brains being beat out was Rodney King. And they found a legal way to say that that was okay. So even the cameras, but at least it's better to have the camera than not have it. But you hit on two things that I want to say to cut it down right and put it on front street. Black men, even today, when you leave home, you're not guaranteed to get back. That's true. 2020. You might get back and you might not. So for those of you who know any little bit, I'm not, I'm not a Bible expert by any means, but one word in there I do know, his name is Satan. That's his brother in the White House. Satan <laughs> is you know you, three by its fruit. Yeah, I'm telling you, you got Satan in a suit and that little red tie that he wears, that's Satan in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> If you need a reason to go vote, if nothing but for that, go vote like your life depends on it because it absolutely and it does. It does. Deborah, you asked, but to get back to what you asked, what it feels like. For me, the worst thing that it does 
that interaction between a black man and a policeman, once that incident is over and you think about it, you start to hate all white people, and that's wrong. That's wrong, yeah. I tried to explain to Mike. When you have someone that breaks you down, as Lavelle said, you, he breaks it down. He's, spread eagle means that you have all the power. I'm no longer a man. You no longer respect me. You just do what I tell you to do. When an incident like that happens to a black man who has a family, who has a job, who has children that look up to him, when he thinks back on that, he starts to hate every black and white car, all white people. Now, all white people are not racist, but that's what that one incident does to you. And that's why I'm so glad that in, back in the 60s, we didn't have a cell phone. But today, our young people, like Lavelle said, you can no longer do that. So I've come a long way because I went to Vietnam and I was supposed to be over there fighting the Viet Cong. I had more hatred for white people than I did for the people that I went over there with because of racism. But today, thank God, we got cell phones that can picture everything that you do. You can no longer run and hide. And the other thing I like about a cell phone is not only can you photograph it, but if somebody tells you something, there's something in that phone called Google. <laughs> you can go into that phone and you can get the right, he can no longer tell you some stuff that you really don't want to, don't understand. You can find it out for yourself. What, oh man, what a way. I'm so glad that we, but it was going to be like this anyway. They didn't know it. It was eventually going to get to where it is right now anyway. And I'm so glad that it's happened like that. You know, I want to pivot on something, just listening to what you guys were saying. And I'm, even though I know this stuff goes on all the time, it still, it still breaks my heart. That song, I'm starting to think we also want to get police officers to listen to it. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, there's got to be some who may be on the borderline of being hate mongers. And a message like that song might be able to just arrest them and bring them back to really looking at what they're doing and the impact that their actions are having on a world of people for generations. For generations and generations. Well, you know, the, the, the thing that bothers me is that when you wind up listening to, if, if you probably notice, all of the people that have interaction that have been negative leading to brutality or death, when you look at those officers, those officers wind up having 14, 15, seven, eight incident reports for the same action. Yes. To me, you cannot, pol the police department cannot police their cells. And that's when I'm hoping that there'll be legislation that will go into effect, that they have to be policed by outside, excuse me, an outside source. Because if you don't, you're gonna have this continue because it, they're, they're, they're a blue gang in their cells. They're gonna wind up, you know, even today, watching Floyd's life snuffed out, there are, there are officers that were on that police force are still rallying for the guy who killed him. Yeah. So that gives you an indication that this, this code of blue has got to be broken up because yeah. as long as you have that going on, it's not going it, to, this, this stuff is not going to change, you know, because they, even, even after the, the killing of Floyd and the things that they did after that by killing the other gentleman, you know, uh, that was asleep in a fast food restaurant, you know, and they, they shot him in the back. And you would think that the light would have come on with them and said, oh, wait a minute, we're, we're being, we're on the, you know, we're being scrutinized now to kill this man running away from him, no threat whatsoever. So it gives you, there's racism in the police department and that's what we have to root out. I'm not saying all, I'm never gonna say all policemen are bad because I have some police friends that are great guys and they're white and black. But for those that are don't evil, take it that long to root out the bad guy. Don't sit there and exactly he needs to go. You know, this guy had 14 incidents, 14, 15 incidents for 
police brutality. And, and what they does wait it take? until somebody gets killed. Yeah. All the yeah. handwriting is on the wall. Wait until he shot killed. two people before before he killed Floyd. So is that going to tell you something wrong with the police department and them policing themselves? Then we're always going to have this problem. And I think now that the you know that this stuff has come to light, I think there's going to be legislation that will take care of that. And, and, and that's the only way we're going to be able to deal with it. Well, I am incredibly proud of what you guys have done. Uh, like I said, the song is not just beautiful music, but it has, like you said, Scotty and Walter, such a powerful message, such a timely message. And it also, you know, it's very contemporary and it transcends it transcend, transcends uh, demographics, it transcends times, you know, not just old school, but contemporary style, all of that's there and, and it's right on time. And, and I do think, I do think that we should try to encourage some police officers to listen to the song too. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Deborah, I don't want to embarrass you, but before we get out of here, I got to say this to you, you well, know. Your audience, uh, they don't know how close you are with the Whispers. I'm <laughs> thank you so much today oh. for giving us this platform. I mean, you know, we did this, we've done this years right. ago, but I, you know, I don't want you to think that we take this for granted. You know us very, very well. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Deborah, because what we've been talking about is so important. I know, you know, this is old hat for you. You interview a lot of entertainers, you know a lot of them. The whispers consider you part of their family. Yeah. You know, I don't want to bash you, but I'm just gonna tell you. I am. You know, people <laughs> out. You guys are my husbands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was driving around in I was driving around in Vegas with two wives in my car so when the board came here to rehearse for her yeah. for her hey, Australian tour. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were hanging out and everything, but oh, I wanted to, and I know people don't know, Deborah is, is a hell of a singer too, so she was out there doing her no, listen, Three Supreme that was, that thing was, herself. That was definitely just a, a new kind of experience. Let me, let me say this real quick too. That trip, I always had a lot of respect for you guys, you know that. And I also have, have always had a lot of respect for entertainers and people who, you know, will hop on a plane, go around the world, across the country, wherever you have to, living out of suitcases. But that took it to a whole nother level. <laughs> because I'm like, every day, I'm like, oh my goodness, another plane, another bus ride, another van ride, another hotel, oh my goodness, another foreign meal. I don't know how you do it, I love you. Your, your music is even that much more valuable because I came to understand a little bit about the price that you pay to deliver beautiful yeah. music to, to the rest of the world. You guys pray a pot. You know, you, look tell fun, you make it look easy, but I'm here to tell you, that's work. <laughs> well, that's my question to you, Deborah. Are you going to go out on tour again or what? what <laughs> or I that was just an experience? Hey, well, well Are you going to slide go? over and let a sister in? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm gonna kick it back to you only if I can go with y'all. Oh, okay. <laughs> and sing this song called How Long in front of that Ohio audience. Mm -hmm. I'm so looking forward to doing that. Yeah. And I know you're gonna be right there, with you, boy. That's what I'm oh, looking you know forward it. to. You know it. In fact, I am. Um, I'm looking forward to really doing some creative things with you guys and like this song and, and I, I know something about the one that's about to be released too. Oh, it's just, the, let me just say to the world, the whispers oh, are still producing beautiful music. Uh, the next time we get together and I'm hoping it's really soon, especially since we don't have to travel to do it, uh, I wanna talk about your music, okay. but I have a special story to tell you about how your music may have recently saved somebody's marriage. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I told, I think I told your marketing uh, director about it. Okay. What'd you say? You. Well, you know what, I want, uh, you just, 
something to borrow because and you know it you know it better than we do but we should absolutely acknowledge the brother that brought this song about magic mendez he's a young brother he plays bass for the whispers in our band he's really the one that wrote produced arranged and did everything but the, but the vo well, vocals too really on this song so we want to send a uh, props out to him magic oh, yeah, keep on absolutely. doing what you do. magic absolutely. is the best Magic, he's he's, awesome. he's he's awesome. He is the bomb. Mm -hmm. Well, this was wonderful. So once again, thank you for letting us do this, Deborah. It means definitely, everything. Definitely. Well, no, look, truly, the thanks is all mine. You guys are the best, and I'm just honored to be in your company. So uh, watch this. Hey, Lavelle, watch this. Hey, Scotty <laughs> and Walter, give each other a big okay. hug from me. <laughs> <laughs> No, that ain't gonna happen. Now you know that. <laughs> I'm pushing it. Right? I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it. I'm you pushing push it. it. You, you know, know every time we get together, we gotta do something different. So that's it. So I love you guys. We'll be together really soon because we gotta do part two. There's so much more to share. Hugs and kisses. That's it. You that's it. it with Deborah and the whisper yeah. for now. Okay. All right. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah.